what happened after that with your mom and your relationship yeah. with your mom? Because it seemed like there was some restoration happening, yeah. but it was a bit of a cliffhanger in terms of where, yeah. where and how she ended up continuing in her journey. What, what happened after that? Bruce Lawn. You mentioned your mom and that yeah. whole part of it probably resonated with me the yeah. most. Having a mom that, that was an alcoholic and, yeah. and struggling and that whole bit. And you put up a, a really cool video about her on Instagram, which mm -hmm. I would encourage people to, to go watch your version of it because you show pictures of her and mm -hmm. how she did really look like Mar Marilyn Monroe. Yeah, she did. Uh, what happened after that with your mom and your yeah. relationship with your mom? Because it seemed like there was some restoration happening, yeah. but it was a bit of a cliffhanger in terms of where, yeah. where and how she ended up continuing in her journey. What, what happened after that? So my mom was a, a really beautiful woman. She was raised in a very strong Christian home. Yeah. Uh, she went to church Sunday morning, Sunday night, midweek studies. They would have missionaries over to the house for Sunday afternoon meals. And But she rebelled at a very early age. Mm. And my aunt, Willie, helped her pack her suitcase as Charlene, my mother, eloped, married a guy, divorced him, married another guy, divorced him. She had a fling in Long Beach, a one-night stand, so to speak, and I was conceived. Mm -hmm. And then she married another guy and mm -hmm. put his name on my birth certificate, and mm -hmm. I found out like 35 years later that he was not my biological father, and I thought he was. And uh, so my mom, you know, went on this long search, and she drank and she smoked and she lived her life, and tragically it took its toll on her. Mm -hmm. So by the time she was 70 she looked much older. Mm -hmm. her, her kidneys were breaking down. Yeah. She was having to get dialysis three times a week. It was really sad. And, um, you know, whenever I'd bring the subject of the gospel up with my mom, she would say, I don't want to talk about it. Mm -hmm. I don't want to talk about it. One day I was driving to church and God spoke to my heart and said, go talk to your mother today. Mm. And I did a U-turn and I called my wife, Kathy. I said, pray for me. I'm going to talk to my mom. So I showed up at her house. I knocked on the door. She was sort of surprised to see me in the afternoon like that. And, and she said, Greg, what are you doing here? I said, Mom, I want to talk to you today about your soul. She said, I don't want to talk about it. I said, today we're going to talk about it. I wasn't going to take no for an answer. Yeah. And it was an awkward, hard conversation with her. But I, I was direct. And she finally broke down. And, and so that conversation resulted in her making a commitment to Christ. Mm. Was she a non-believer who came to Christ or was she the longest running prodigal of all time? <laughs> <laughs> I don't know, but yeah. all I know is she made that commitment to the Lord and tragically a month later, oh my gosh. she died. Oh my goodness. And, and so I was hoping that now she's a Christian, we're going to have this great future yeah. together and a closer relationship because you know I always loved my mother. Mm. I had to take care of her because mm -hmm. no one else was caring for her. Mm -hmm. Guys would come in and out of her, out of her life, mm -hmm. and she was left alone. So sometimes I was the only one to make sure she got to bed at night. I was the one to make sure she got something to eat. I was, you know, I was in some ways like a parent in the yeah. relationship. Yeah. So I always felt this protective thing around my mom. Yeah. I've got to take care of my mother, mm. and I felt that all through life. Yeah, what do you? What advice do you have for? Uh, I mean, there's a lot of people watching, myself included, that yeah. we 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 have became the parent to the parent. Yeah, you know, and there there's addiction there. There's a history of, yeah. of trauma and all kinds of things there. How do you? How do we navigate those situations in terms of caring? I mean, you're talking about practically parenting a parent, but then you're also talking about speaking into their soul and wanting them to to surrender to Jesus. How? how what advice would you have to navigate that? Well, I would say never give up, mm. you know, never give up. Keep praying. Jesus said, seeking you shall find, knock on the door shall be op open, ask and it shall be given to you. And in the original language, it implies continuing to do that. Keep asking, keep so seeking, keep knocking. Mm. It's it's hard to share the gospel with members of your family. Yeah. So you've got to earn the right by living it and showing them the gospel. Yeah. yeah. Live the gospel. Yeah. But when that moment comes, you need to just speak out and get through the awkwardness and do your best to try to help them come to Jesus. I'm, there's so many people I know. My mother married a man. He was the one man she was married to the longest. And he and I never had a real close relationship. And his name was Bill. And uh, so after they, after my mother died, I didn't see much of Bill. Mm. And uh, someone came to me a few months later or a few years later actually and said bill's really sick you should go see him mm -hmm. 
And, and I actually didn't want to do it because mm. it was a strain in our relationship. And I was on my way to go speak somewhere when I heard this news. And I said, I'll tell you what, I'll go, I'll go see him after I get back. And as I was on my way to the airport, again, the Lord speaks to me and says, you go see him right now. I go back to the same house where I saw my mother and had that conversation. He was in hospice care. Mm. They, had a, they had a hospital bed in his den. And I look at him and I could see he was not long for this life. Mm. And I said, Bill, I, I know, you know, you're close to death. And I want you to know that God loves you and has a plan for your life. And he, Jesus Christ died on the cross for your sin. And I said, would you like to accept Christ into your life? He said, yes. I led him in a prayer. And I was, then I walked out and I was thinking, I'm so thankful I had that conversation I didn't want to have because mm. of the awkwardness of it. I got on the plane. I landed where I was going to speak. And I got a text on my phone. Bill just died. Oh, my gosh. So I think the takeaway <sighs> truth for me and that I would share with others is, don't put it off. If the Lord gives you that little nudge, timing is everything. Mm, yeah. And I actually had kind of a full-time ministry sharing the gospel with my mother's old husband. Hey, you want to see something crazy? 67% of the people who watch this channel are not subscribed. Do me a quick favor. Make sure you hit that subscribe button so you stay up to date on all the videos here on the Bless God Studios channel. Another one of her husbands, the guy who ended up adopting me, Oscar Laurie, um, he's the father that she's leaving in the film. Mm -hmm, mm -hmm. And I'm always like drawing the name yeah, Laurie yeah, with yeah, that little yeah. family crest, which means that buds are fresh. It's a tree that's been cut down. It's a stump and it's growing back. And uh, he's the only man who ever treated me as a father should treat a son. Yeah. So I called him dad. I was taken away from him in my childhood. And when I became a young adult in my early 20s and our church was going, I wanted to reconnect with him. Yeah. And so I found him again before Google. <laughs> so <laughs> there was a girl that went to our church who was an attorney and she found him through the Bar Association. Uh -huh. I didn't even know if he was alive still. Uh -huh. I found him in New Jersey. I called his office and they said, uh, law office of Oscar Laurie. I said, yes, is Mr. Laurie in? The secretary said, no, he's out at lunch. Can I ask who's calling? I said, Greg Laurie. She said, how do you spell your last name? I said, the same way he spells his. <laughs> this is his son. Yeah. So I got a call really quickly, and he said, oh, Greg, it's so good to hear from you. And I said, listen, I'm going to be in New York speaking in Central Park. Maybe we could get together for lunch. He said, oh, no, come come to our house for, for dinner. In fact, stay the weekend with us. Oh, I don't want to impose. No, come, come. So, mm. okay. So Kathy and I and our son Christopher flew to New York. I spoke. And then we got on the train, pulled into New Jersey. And it was a place called uh, Bancroft, uh, Lincroft, excuse me, Lincroft, New Jersey. I got off the train and boy, he looked just like I remembered mm. him. So we spent that night catching up. And as it turned out, he heard the crazy life my mom was living. And he was my, he had adopted me. He was my father. He tried to get custody of me and he couldn't. Oh, man. And uh, and then that night, we're sitting at the table, and his wife, Barbara, he had remarried, beautiful lady and yeah. great Italian cook. And uh, we had a wonderful meal. And Barbara said, Greg, tell me how you became a Christian. So I sat at the table, and I'm sharing my story. And the whole time, my dad is just sitting there, just with his hands up to his face like that, mm -hmm. just watching me. I felt like I'm in a courtroom, yeah. and he's the judge. He's, he's weighing the information. I share my whole story and she's all excited and responsive. He doesn't respond at all. He just looks at me. Then that night he said, Greg, I want to, can you walk with me in the morning? And I said, sure, dad. Well, as it turns out, I left this part out. He had had uh, heart problems mm -hmm. and blacked up behind the steering wheel and had hit a telephone pole and almost died. And so he, his heart, he was on medication. And uh, so he had to walk every morning. So he knocked on my door Six o'clock in the morning, New Jersey time, three o'clock in the morning, California time. <laughs> so we're walking along and he turns to me and says, Greg, I listened very carefully to what you said last night. Mm -hmm. Let me just say my father was very intelligent. He would read thick history books, you know, one a week. He just was a learner and yeah. a very smart, very moral man. Mm -hmm. And he said, I listened very carefully to what you said last night. And I said, yes. And he said, I'd like to accept Jesus Christ into my life. Mm -hmm. I said, well, and I was calling him dad at this point. I said, well, dad, I need to tell you again what it means. And I went over the whole gospel because I understand. I want to accept Jesus Christ right now. He says, what do I need to do? I said, and we're walking through a park at this point. I said, well, you need to pray. He stops and drops to his knees. Wow. I'm like, whoa, 
okay, I wasn't going to get on my knees, but okay, let's do this. Yeah. So I got my knees. I prayed with him. He prayed this prayer and he says, Greg, pray for my heart. Pray God heals my heart. I prayed for his heart. He gets up and he, he was so excited. It was the most dramatic conversion I've ever seen. Wow. And he said, you know, my doctor's office is right near here. Let's go over and see him. And I want to tell him I've accepted Jesus and that my heart is healed. I said, well, dad, we don't know if your heart yeah. is healed. Yeah. He goes, well, let's go see him. So we go over to this doctor's office, walk in and, and he's a nice Jewish man. And yeah. he says, Oscar, how are you? He goes, Doc, this is my son, Greg. He's a preacher from California, which already that sounds suspicious, right? They don't like Californians <laughs> in a lot of places. And I just accepted Jesus into my heart, and my heart is healed. Yeah. I'm going, oh, boy. Oh, And the doctor says, well, Oscar, we need to run some tests on you. They ran the test, and literally his heart was healed. Wow. So he somehow knew this, and he lived 15 more years and served the Lord and walked with the Lord. So, you know, wow. it. That's God, amazing. God can go back to your life yeah. and, and and he can change things. Yeah. He can change the narrative. Mm -hmm. And I think it's important to forgive people who have hurt you. Yeah. And then try to bring the love of God to them. Just one more quick story. My mom married this one guy who almost killed her. They were living in Hawaii and he he and my mom would drink and they would fight, literally have physical fights. And one night they knocked out a plain glass window and the cops came. But one night I heard a big thud and a loud noise. And I went to the front room and my mom was lying there in a pool of blood. Mm. And he was standing over her with a wooden statue. Mm -hmm. And and he said, go to bed. It's just ketchup. I remember that as a little boy. Wow. Went into my room, opened my window, climbed out, ran over to a neighbor, told them the ambulance came, the police came. She left that man. Fast forward many years, I'm in Hawaii preaching at the Waikiki Shell. Mm. Someone tells me that guy lives right near there. Mm. And they said, you should go talk to him because he's very sick. So I went over to meet him with Kathy. And I thought maybe he'll come to the Lord. He wasn't interested at all. Mm. I shared the gospel with him. He's go, oh, that's nice. Good for you. I go, well, I'm going to speak over here. Would you like to come? He didn't want to come. Mm. So my point is, you got to make the effort. Yeah, yeah. My mom came around. Oscar came around. This guy didn't come around. But yeah. like I said, I had a full-time yeah. ministry ministering yeah. to my mom's old husband. Yeah. I mean, that's a pretty good batting average, though. Not bad. <laughs> <laughs> we got three out of four. That's yeah. amazing. Was there ever any bit of resentment or unforgiveness towards your mom for keeping your dad from you? No, I actually look back on that, and I think that was overall... If that had happened, if my father had gotten custody of me, my life would not have yeah. gone the direction it yeah. went. And as bad as it was at times, I I took a little journey yep. and through process of elimination, I realized what I did not want in life. Yeah. You know, I'm just a kid, but I'm looking at my mother's sometimes affluent lifestyle and I'm thinking, I don't want that life. Mm. Then I got into the drug culture myself. And I even before I was a Christian, I knew that was a dead end street. Mm -hmm. I didn't want to do drugs even before I'd become a believer, but I thought, where is the answer? Yeah. If I'd been living in New Jersey with a good father, I mean, I'm not saying God couldn't have reached me or wouldn't have reached me, yeah. but I'm saying that this is the life the Lord allowed me to live yeah. that brought me to faith, yes. that brought me to where I am yeah. right now. Yeah. So I think, you know, it's Romans 8, 28, all things work yeah. together for good to those that love God. Yeah. It's interesting when, when, when I hear and I talk to folks who've experienced trauma like that and rough upbringings, uh, they all kind of say, say the same thing. They say they wouldn't have changed anything, yeah. you know, and that's the that's the providence of God there is this yeah. somehow God just works it all out and it works for our good. Well, so, I have a heart for hurting people. Yeah. I, you know, I, when I look at people, I look at young people, especially, and they're lost and they're searching and, yeah. and, you know, my heart goes out to them. And mm -hmm. so, because I've been there, yep. I know what it feels like. I wasn't raised in a Christian home. I was raised in the opposite of mm -hmm. one. Mm -hmm. But uh, so I still really want, what was the exception of my childhood is in some ways more like the rule today. Mm. When I was a kid, all my friends had parents, mm. you know, they had meals <laughs> at home, you know, around the table. Yeah. And I'm this kind of free spirit. Yep. I would, I, in fact, every night I went out, I went to a restaurant, doesn't exist anymore. It was called the snack shop. Every night I would get a hamburger, a vanilla shake, and fries. And I would tell my friends what I had for dinner. They couldn't believe it. They envied my life. But I had this one friend that had a family, and they would sit around the table, and I would go eat 
at his house, not because the food was good, but because I love this family idea. And after a while, I got tired of a hamburger, a vanilla malt and fries. I wanted family. Yeah. I wanted stability. Yeah. I wanted parameters because yeah. I could do whatever I want. I got in trouble in school. They wanted to expel me. Mm -hmm. And my mom met with the principal and said she'd sue him mm -hmm. if they expelled me. So mm -hmm. I stayed in school, mm -hmm. you know. And so I just was always getting into trouble. I was crying out for attention. Yeah. I was looking for someone to tell me what was true. That's so good. We're going to go over to our Patreon exclusive section, and I'm going to ask you about revival and okay. what we're seeing with Osbury Revival. And I also want to ask you, why do movements die, which was a conversation we had at uh, breakfast this morning. Yes. So, hey, if you enjoyed this video and you want to see the full extended version of this podcast, be sure to sign up for our Patreon community for only five dollars a month. It'll really help us continue contextualizing the gospel using YouTube, media, and podcasting. And in exchange, you will get full unedited versions of the podcast, of our daily after-party streams, a discount for our merch store, and exclusive access to our private Discord server. It's only $5 a month. The link for Patreon is in the description of this video, as well as the pinned comment below. Again, hit the link in the description, sign up now, and I'll see you over there, all right? Peace.